Hello, everyone. Uh, bienvenue. My name is Mathieu Rondeau. I'm head of uh, communications and communities at Leonard's, uh, the Vinci Group's platform for foresight and innovation. Uh, for those of you who connect with us for the first time today, uh, Vinci is a global leader in construction and concessions with more than 200,000 staff operating in more than 100 countries. Uh, Leonard, which is a, a welcoming greeting you today, was created three years ago to have the brands of the group to tackle together the uh, transformative challenges in our business lines uh, in, uh, in which we're facing in construction, mobility, energy, and uh, networks. The main drivers for this transformation, of course, uh, are the uh, digitization of our business lines and markets, uh, but also the environmental transition, which is now generating high expectations in construction, mobility, and energy. Uh, but naturally speaking, the health and economic crisis uh, now add up to these challenges, and it's time to discuss uh, these uh, issues. Um, in order to help Vinci drive these challenges, uh, Leonard has placed its bets on the combination of uh, strategic thinkings with experts from Vinci brands, uh, um, uh, with uh, uh, acceleration programs that are designed to help teams from Vinci, uh, from our BUs and uh, entrepreneurs to start their businesses and to foster cooperations uh, between our businesses and mature startups. Um, and finally, uh, through thought leadership uh, that uh, expresses uh, uh, on our blog and through the organization of conferences in our lab in Paris. Um, during the time of uh, the COVID crisis and confinement, uh, uh, we're, of course, uh, unable to welcome you physically at Leonard Paris, but we have continued to offer a series of daily conferences uh, from our team members, uh, partners, and experts uh, to help us make sense of this crisis and gear up for what's coming next. Uh, as always, these conferences are accessible to our whole community of innovators from Vinci, from other corporates, um, startups, investors, and clients. So welcome to you all. Uh, for this 25th session, uh, we have chosen to organize a dialogue between two of the most prominent investors in construction technology in the USA, our partners and friends, Ray Levitt from Blackhorn Black Ventures and Darren Bechtel, from brick and mortar ventures who will deliver their views on the way the crisis will impact startups and venture investment and ultimately the transformation of construction businesses and the job site. Um, our head of startups and open innovation, Guillaume Bazouin. Uh, hi, Guillaume. will be in charge of introducing our, our two speakers and leading this conversation. Uh, please feel free to post your comments and questions on the chat right-hand side of your browser window, and you will share them uh, with our speakers. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, thank you, Ray. Thank you, Darren and Guillaume, of course. Uh, the floor is yours. I'll let you uh, drive with and follow through with this conversation. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you, Mathieu. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, welcome, Darren and Ray. Um, I'm going to give you a chance to introduce yourself a little more uh, thoroughly, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, take, a, take a crack at it first. So uh, Darren, uh, Darren Bechtel, the founder and managing director of Brick and Mortar Venture, the leading sector specific venture capital fund focused on emerging technologies to improve the way we design, build, and maintain our built environments. Uh, Darren holds a, a bachelor's of science in mechanical engineering with a product design focus from Stanford University, and an MBA from the uh, Stanford Graduate School of Business. Uh, we're also joined by uh, Ray Levitt. Um, I had to cut your bio by quite a bit to make it fit into the our timeline, Ray. Uh, but Ray recently joined Blackhorn Venture uh, Ventures as an operating partner in 2017. Uh, before joining Blackhorn, he worked for five years in the civil engineering uh, uh, on the civil engineering faculty at MIT, and then moved to Stanford. He retired from Stanford in 2017 as a Kumagai professor of civil and environmental engineering uh, emeritus after co-leading the Digital Cities Initiative on Stanford's Global Project Center. Uh, Ray, you also uh, co-founded three software startups and have. Uh, led quite a few uh, consulting uh, uh, work with uh, major companies in the US and abroad. And uh, you two are actually here today uh, to uh, discuss the impact that uh, COVID-19 uh, is having on uh, 
a few different elements. First, on the different the startups that are in the fields that we're interested in, uh, on the industry uh, itself, and on uh, what you are uh, doing as investors. Uh, so, at very first, uh, what I'd like you to do is give you an opportunity to introduce your firms and the, the focus uh, that uh, you have. And maybe you know if you have a couple more things to say about uh, yourself, uh, it would be a very welcome time to do so. So maybe we'll open up with Ray. Oh, Ray, I think you're on mute. Correct, I was. Thank you, Guillaume, uh, and thanks to Vinci for hosting this event uh, through Leonard, your very innovative uh, startup uh, or innovation hub that you have created. Um, just a little about my background. I was born into a civil engineering family. My father was a structural engineer in South Africa where I was born. You can see some of the curios on the desk in the back there that come from my home country. Um, I came to Stanford as a graduate student after a degree in civil engineering and working in marine construction for a number of years and stayed in school too long uh, by mistake and then made me a professor because no one in the industry would hire a PhD at the time I graduated. Um, but because I was a, an accidental professor, I was also interested in startups. So I was involved in three separate software startups. One that I would categorize as a failure, which in Silicon Valley means that you are now experienced. You're not a loser. Um, and then the second and third ones were more successful, which allowed me to become an angel investor. And then um, Darren and I were both very early investors in some of the initial construction startups uh, in the tech space. And then I was frustrated because we were playing with such small amounts of money that we were leaving a lot of opportunity on the table. So I joined a venture fund in 2017 to be able to make bigger investments in startups. Um, our fund is, uh, actually our company has three funds. The uh, first is a seed fund that makes very early pre-seed and seed investments, often the first investments in companies uh, from institutional investors. The second fund is a larger growth fund that makes A and B round investments. And we have just launched what we call Blackhorn Select, which will make C round investments together with co-investors uh, co who are limited partners or others. Uh, the three sectors we invest in are primarily in the built environment, which is the largest number of our portfolio companies. Uh, like Darren's fund, we invest at every stage, design, construction, and property uh, tech property management. Uh, we also invest in the transportation logistics center, particularly in logistics hubs and um, software to coordinate uh, things like electric trucks and electric forklifts and electric vehicles. And then in the third sector is energy, but again, with a specific focus on grid management, microgrid management, and uh, financial technology for um, renewable energy. Well, thanks, thanks, Ray. Uh, I guess, uh, uh, Darren, I'd love to uh, have you uh, go over what you do at uh, at uh, brick and mortar and like talk a little bit more about yourself as well. All right, merci Guillaume, merci à tout Da Vinci. Uh, bonsoir, uh, désolé, je ne parle pas français, or at least not as well as I would like. So that's the extent of it. You're going to get the rest in English. Um, so. Darren Bechtel, uh, founder and managing director of Brick and Mortar Ventures. Uh, thank you for the intro. Um, I will add to it and say that it's it's safe to say I was born into the world of engineering and construction. Uh, the family business is the largest private engineering construction firm in the world. Um, uh, 121 years now. Um, got started with my great great grandfather with two donkeys and a scraper doing uh, grading work in front of the railroads as they were being built west in the US. And fast forward to today, um, it is being run by fifth generation family leadership, my brother Brendan at the helm of CEO. Um, so I got started um, at the young age of 14. I uh, spent summers throughout school uh, working in the uh, various trades. I had been everything from a uh, gopher to the gopher of a home building crew, um, forklift operator, mason, finished carpenter, uh, and then did field engineering, um, uh, some uh, light project management, um, and even spent a summer overseeing a team of pile drivers on the expansion of the world's largest coal terminal in Newcastle, New South Wales, Australia, uh, all before I turned uh, uh, 18. So um, a bit unique of a background, but par for the course growing up in the family. 
Um, I did product design or mechanical engineering with a product design focus at Stanford. Um, the, uh, this predates their now famous D school, um, but core to the whole program was the concept of user focused design and a blend of the engineering core classes mixed with the more creative um, design thinking, um, kind of creative problem solving. So very much a tinkerer. Uh, I was a machinist and TIG welder. I taught a bike frame building class. So, you know, I love tinkering around with my hands. Um, uh, my uh, professional career, um, a bit serpentine. I can loosely make some sense of it only in hindsight. Um, but following school, I got recruited to join a commercial architecture firm uh, as an in-house engineer. Um, you can translate that into CAD monkey. Um, so I was responsible for converting a lot of hand uh, sketches into CAD models. Um, did construction administration work, was doing the uh, review of shop drawings, um, but ultimately missed the, the hands-on tinkering side. We, we as an architecture firm would take these design concepts right up to the point where you'd need to figure out how to make it. And at that point, we would hand it off to the engineering consultancies. And so I really missed being part of the, the sort of problem solving or realization process. And so in a bit of a pivot, I left, um, came back to the San Francisco Bay Area, um, which was uh, had been home to me before going to the East Coast. And I joined a medical device startup as an R&D engineer. And that was my first introduction to the world of startups. Um, in this case, in the life sciences uh, space, um, as an R&D engineer, I helped design a breast cancer biopsy device that we took from early prototypes through to FDA approval um, in the early stages of commercialization. And over the seven years that followed, on uh, a rather telenovela worthy journey, um, I moved from R&D engineer to board member and ultimately after getting my MBA at Stanford um, was the turnaround CEO uh, attempting to relaunch this company fall. Um, uh, recession. And so that was a, a humbling experience. I wish I could say that you should, um, you can quickly read about the screaming success of this first time CEO. And unfortunately I have to chalk that one up to a, a pretty hardcore learning experience. Um, that was where I was thrown into the deep end of the pool um, from startup operations and management. And I firsthand got to uh, appreciate and experience the challenges of trying to manage a growing startup, um, especially in a, a heavily competitive, heavily regulated um, environments such as medical devices. Uh, in parallel, um, in starting a business school, I started doing venture investing, um, gambling with my own money. Uh, so angel investing, backing fellow classmates and young alumni out of the Stanford programs that were struggling to get seed capital. Um, but at least I thought um, as a self-taught investor, they had some pretty good ideas. Uh, so I started to deploy my own capital. Um, it was um, it sort of helped to re-energize me. Um, I found it very therapeutic that I could would get beat up all day in the med device world and then be able to turn to this role of sort of mentor and advisor, sort of the the 90 year old war veteran, um, retelling stories of you know PTSD moments, um, and quickly knew that that venture was my calling or at least my passion, um, and so after I closed the chapter on the medical device experience. I opened up a co-working and incubator space for Stanford entrepreneurs and focused full time on the venture investing. Initially industry agnostic. Um, and as the portfolio grew, I realized that um, being a generalist investor, um, it wasn't a particularly scalable model. Um, and it appeared even at those early days in 2015 that um, the future of early stage venture would be these sort of sector specific focus um, where you could really try to carve out and own a category of investing and establish a world-class brand as a topic expert um, that could really help young startups get through um, establishing product market fit, help in refining those solutions and ultimately landing some of the early uh, sort of co-development partners, your pilot partners. Um, and so after some soul searching to try to figure out where did, um, where did I believe I had an unfair advantage and a competitive differentiation over other investors, I, I was able to look at this portfolio of um, existing investments and lo and behold, the embarrassingly late realization was that they all fell into what is now brick and mortars investment thesis and narrative. 
Um, we get branded the construction tech VC, but more accurately, we invest in emerging technologies that help improve the way that we design, build, operate, and maintain the built environment. Uh, when we got started in 2015, uh, we were the first and only, which is not great. Um, it's sort of like claiming that you're great at winning auctions. You might just be the only one that's paying the money and it might not be a good idea. Um, but we were hoping at the time that we were early movers and that we would ultimately see the vast adoption and digital transformation of a uh, uh, $11 trillion global industry that had been lagging most as far as adoption of digital tools and new technology. Um, in 2017, we raised our first outside capital. Um, uh, up until then, had still been deploying my own. Um, right now, we're, we're thrilled that we're investing out of our first fund of pooled capital. Um, and unlike most venture funds, we're entirely backed by corporate strategics. Um, and some of the leaders across the global construction value chain, uh, ranging from designers and builders to vendors and suppliers and software developers, um, uh, engineering construction consultancies. Um, uh, and so we very much have a for us by us model that we think is part of our um, competitive advantage over other firms. I'll wrap it there. <laughs> Thanks, Darren. Thanks. Uh, so you actually touched on a, a couple of points uh, 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 I wanted to talk about with you guys, but one is actually a question I've been asking myself for a little while. And be beyond uh, uh, you, Darren, saying, well, I just didn't do it, do it soon enough, but how come we had to wait for the mid-2010s to see sort of like innovation through venture capital flow into this uh, this sector, like, I, you know, just to give a, a bit of context to like the people listening to us that might not know, like, I, I don't know if you guys have the numbers for 2019, but I was looking at the sector trending up, like up towards like nine, 10 billion uh, US dollars. Uh, yeah, uh, US dollars, uh, all the way from like less than three, two years before that. So it's really exploding. Um, anyway, so I guess my question to be more specific is like, you know, why did it take so long to see a boom in investment in this sector when it's so obvious that there's something to do. And I'll, I'll give it to Ray because uh, yeah, I think he's, he's been around the block and seen some of this stuff for a little while. So I'd like to actually refute a myth that civil engineers or construction has been slow to adopt computers. The first commercial use of computers after World War II where computers were used for decrypting German signals and um, and, and tracking artillery um, trajectories of, of uh, artillery shells and so on was actually civil engineering. Um, the application of mainframe computers commercialized by IBM in the 1960s, uh, the very first application was a structural engineering application developed by MIT, Carnegie Mellon, Illinois, and Georgia Tech, and then a surveying application where you could throw away your nine-figure log logarithm book, which I used when I was a student, which uh, you know weighed as much as war and peace. Um, and you could um, actually use a computer to solve these problems. But this was for people who worked in offices and in large companies that could afford mainframe computers, which were both capital expensive and also expensive to operate. You needed priests in white coats with glass temples that housed mainframe computers. And most uh, small engineering consulting studios could not afford them. It was the big Parsons Brinkerhoff and Camp Dresser, McKee, and companies like this were able to use them. So civil engineers were very early to adopt computers in the design stage. Uh, but for construction, there are some good reasons why they could not be used. And the main reason is that people run around job sites. They can't carry laptops. They can't even, um, even if they had laptops, they weren't connected to anything. So they would only be good for computation, not for communication. And so computers really were not used much for communication until about 1980s. Xerox PARC came out with the star computer system. They did actually invent the Ethernet, not Al Gore, who sometimes claims to do that. Um, and they um, created the bitmap screen, and they perfected the mouse that Doug Engelbart had uh, pioneered at SRI. And so Steve Jobs saw that and created the Apple Macintosh with his friend uh, Wozniak. Uh, Xerox sold them the license for all of that technology because they didn't think they were anything other than a copier company. Uh, they got 10% of the original Apple stock, which would be worth over $100 billion today. Xerox is now fighting to survive. Interestingly, just tried to buy HP as a way to survive, which um, would require a lot of debt. Luckily, they didn't. 
both companies would have died. In any case, the early construction applications were CAD on PCs, AutoCAD, uh, came out at a trade show in the, in the 1980s, and there was software for project management um, that came out about the same time. Um, Apple actually had one of the best project uh, scheduling applications I've ever seen called Mac Project, which they never commercialized. They decided to get out of building um, application software. But the, um, the adoption of people on construction sites needed really two things, and, and to some degree a third. They needed to have uh, smart mobile devices that you could carry around in your pocket or at least in your hand and, and actually use because they were connected to the internet somehow. So we needed smart mobile devices. We needed at least Wi-Fi on job sites and later on cell networks with broadband. And a third thing for this industry, which is very cyclical, is a way of paying for software that was flexible. So the, the SaaS subscription model, I think, made it very easy for construction firms to adopt point solutions. And so I think the reason you didn't see it on construction sites was just people running around job sites couldn't use computers. And once they became powerful mobile devices, which, you know, the smartphone in any of your pockets is more powerful than the original IBM uh, mainframe computer in every way, including being much more intuitive with the interfaces, voice and touch and so on. And so that's what it took. And then all of a sudden, all these old paper-based processes that go back to the pyramids, literally, you can see drawings on papyrus in the, in the Cairo Museum and the British Museum from the time of the Egyptian temples and pyramids. And we actually stopped doing that when, when Plan Grid came out, um, launched in 2010. Uh, we'll talk more about that later, why that was actually a good time, even though it was on the heels of a big recession. And following that, and, and just this explosion that you referred to, Guillaume, that uh, both uh, Darren and I have witnessed in the last 10 years. Uh, mostly digitizing point solutions and now getting to be a little more than that. So, so I guess the follow-up question for you, Darren, would be, uh, you know, you're, you're at the core of the of this engine now. And like, why why do you think it's growing so fast? Like, yes, it's a really big market, but is that is that the whole story? Or like, you know, how come it's yeah. going so fast? Yeah, uh, I think it's um, sort of piggybacking off of Ray's comments. Uh, it wasn't until recent past that you really could develop solutions for construction. Um, there's a number of great market reports that show how construction as an industry has lagged all the other industries as far as investments in IT and digitization of processes. Um, most of those people interpret as pointing the finger at the engineering and construction firm saying shame on you. But it wasn't until recently that purpose built solutions could actually be developed for the people doing the work because the work happens in the field. Um, those, those early computers that um, radically transformed the way that, that the world designed and engineered projects, um, massive impact. But today, the, the engineering and design aspect of work usually accounts for only 5% of project volume. It's pretty efficient. Until you're designing to radically change the way that you are building, um, the field is where um, the bulk of the cost is going now. The field is where the, the accidents happen, the delays um, run into the field is where the humans still are. Um, and so until you could really develop um, um, those purpose-built solutions, you weren't going to dramatically improve the productivity uh, productivity of job sites. And Ray highlighted it. You can't expect everyone to carry around a 30-pound laptop. Um, so it really was the, the the advent of you know the ubiquity of mobile connectivity, mobile computing devices, sensor networks that um, you can now connect the job site to the cloud and the office and the trailer. Um, construction, you're, you're operating in the field that's a dynamic, dangerous environment, um, uh, some, some sense of organized chaos. If in order to leverage modern day cloud computing, it takes weeks to install the basic infrastructure to be able to access the cloud. Um, those productivity gains you might realize could be outpaced or um, you know, outweighed by um, the delays and sort of being able to set it up. So rapidly deployable, easy to configure solutions um, would be hugely valuable. But what had also been lacking was uh, access to risk capital. Um, somebody needs to invest in developing the solutions. Um, in the, the sort of early, you know, um, sort of um, uh, internet 1.0, um, 
many of the builders, the large global um, engineering construction firms started trying to develop their own solutions in house. And some are still licking the wounds from that. I'm um, realizing that, you know, the, the difference in responsibilities and functions of being a software developer or being a builder uh, it's very different roles, very different people you need to recruit and retain. Um, it can be done and some people are doing a pretty good job of it. Um, but many realize that uh, if a solution is developed out of house and is able to get the um, sort of risk capital from investors and also provide the solution to a number of competitors, uh, customers, um, there's a, an increased odd of being able to recruit top talent um, there's a higher uh, opportunity for success. Um, and so, uh, you know, there was limited access to, to venture capital um, until this, the last couple of years because venture capitalists that are trying to figure out how to maximize their returns for their investors looked and up until 2017, there hadn't been a, a billion dollar exit of a single construction tech startup. Um, and so VCs that are hoping to make billions are going to say, man, it's never happened. I get it someday it will, but I have no knowledge of the space. How do I pull some levers? I don't even know uh, one of the large potential customers, at least a, a generalist investor would say. So, you know, rightfully so, risk capital wanted to wait and see, you know, when, when, what are going to be the signs that now is the time that this fund life is going to be when we can make the money? Um, yeah, you know, when are, when is there going to be growth stage? Um, uh, investments that go in to accelerate um, sales and scale up growth to really make a meaningful difference. Um, and then will, will the exits follow? And we've just seen that in the last couple of years that there was, you know, within first 12 months, um, actually in the first two months, you saw your first two unicorn exits. Um, and, uh, you know, now the, as, as you mentioned earlier, the, the flooding of venture capital to the space, um, you're seeing entrepreneurs also flocking um, to this opportunity, um, realizing that there is venture capital. Um, it's a little bit of the chicken and the egg. It's unclear who started first, um, but we're seeing a, a massive snowballing. Um, you know, four years ago, there was an article in CB Insights talking about the 31 construction tech startups. Um, and today, just doing a quick look, there's over 3,300. Um, you know, it's a different day and we can't roll back time um, and better and better solutions are coming. And I think one of the things we'll jump into is talking about how sometimes it is out of necessity that you see the transformation of certain industries and the adoption of technologies. And it does seem like <laughs> um, we're at one of those points right now um, that you try to make the best of a bad situation and sometimes forces radical change in behavior. Yeah, well, you, you're bringing it right into the subject of the day there like <laughs> better than if we rehearsed it uh, <laughs> but re really the, you know what we're seeing you know covid uh literally brought construction to a halt in more or less in, in different places in france it certainly did it did in some places in the us uh i i i you know from what i read it was extremely dependent on the state and even the counties uh We've seen very large companies, uh, Vinci Construction is an example, but like many others that have had to curtail their operations by huge factors. Uh, and a lot of smaller businesses have pretty uncertain days in front of them, uh, given the typical sort of like margin structure that you'd expect uh, for anybody that's working in this in this industry. So, uh, and that's like, a, that's like the literally maybe trillion dollar question in here is, you know, from your perspective, like how's the, the current crisis and the subsequent economic consequences as they impact our industry, uh, how are they going to affect innovation in the field? And one of the elements that, you know, goes beyond like there's, you know, times of crisis or times of innovation is you need people to buy this innovation, right? So are the are the GCs and the subs and like the supply chain people going to be able to buy this solution? Um, so maybe we'll open it up to 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 Ray for like the first uh, first take on that, and that's that's really the meat of our exchange today. Because really, there's very few people that have answers to that question, and a lot of our public I know is interested in that. 
So, you know, Darren's family has been in this industry for five generations. Uh, I've watched this industry for a little less time than that, but um, <laughs> certainly for more than one generation. And I've got a grandchild of two running around my house and, and Darren has one a little younger than that. Um, and so um, what, what I see is this is an industry that's always had dramatic fluctuation in its demand caused by previous crises. So going back, you know, in 1989, one of the startups I launched right into a financial recession. We never knew it, obviously, when we launched the company. Launched another company in 2000. Very, very difficult to raise venture capital at that time because of the dot-com collapse. But companies that get formed in these recessions learn to really live with less capital, to be more efficient, uh, to be very, very uh, close to customers. And so some of the most successful companies of all time have been born in recessions. And there is still venture capital money around um, for very interesting early seed stage companies. I think what you'll see is that there is a more of a challenge for the A and B round companies that especially if they are coming to an investor like Darren or me for the first time, uh, Darren can express their point of view. But what's happening in our fund, I'll first talk about the fund, then I'll go back and talk about the industry more broadly. What we're doing is we're finding some of our A round companies that we previously invested in are looking for a little bridge capital to get them through six or 12 months to the other side of this uh, downturn. Uh, construction will be one of the first industries to come back, by the way. It's already operating at some level on so-called essential facilities like low-income housing, uh, emergency hospitals. A lot of schools are using the school shutdowns to do work in six months that they normally do in three months in the summer, both university level and also K through 12. And so there is still some construction going on. But, you know, just for a perspective, after the 19, I'm sorry, after the 2007 financial crisis, uh, between 2007 and 2009, commercial construction in San Francisco Bay Area went down by 80%. And it would have gone down even further if there were not two big Stanford hospitals going on that already were underway. And so we've seen these kind of downturns before. I think this one is different. If I was a commercial developer or a general contractor who was mostly involved in building office buildings, I would be very nervous <laughs> because people are learning to work from home companies are realizing they need less real estate for their offices. And I don't think commercial will come back now the way it did after the 2007. And so from an investment perspective, we curated our investments from the beginning for companies that would have something to offer people even in a slow market, or perhaps even especially in a slow market. You know, we can talk about portfolio companies perhaps later, but part of our investment thesis was companies that would have some resilience, even in a downturn. So they would be connected to ERP or project management corporate systems, which makes them very sticky. It's difficult to get them installed because you've got to have those integrations, but once they're in, they're sticky. Applications that help people chase new business more effectively, like Pipe, which speeds up the prospe uh, processing of specifications. Um, Brick, which helps people focus their marketing efforts using AI on top of big uh, data pools and so on. So we look for companies that could actually offer value in a downturn. Of course, this is a more serious downturn, but it won't be as long, I don't think, for the construction industry as it has been. And historically, what we have seen is that there is a, a counter cyclical element in construction. The commercial and industrial construction that happens in a boom, you know, will, will lag about one or two years behind a general economic recession as projects that have gone pretty far along get finished up, even though some will get canceled. But then what happens typically is interest rates fall dramatically, both by natural demand, but also by central banks lowering interest rates and, and, and engaging in, in buying, buying bonds and so on to stimulate um, activity. And so when interest rates fall, then housing becomes more affordable because for someone buying a house or, or buying a condo, the first year mortgage is all interest basically. So if interest rates go from four or 5% down to 2%, it basically costs you half as much to buy the same house. And so we've typically seen housing construction as kind of a balance wheel. And the second area is governments invest in infrastructure and downturns, so or they try to. Turns out there are not as many shovel-ready projects as governments would like, but there usually are some. And they create others and they do maintenance and they do upgrades. And so residential and institutional universities will build in a downturn to get bargains if they can finance it by gifts from alumni or from their, their endowments. 
And so there's some counter cyclical elements in this case where the whole industry is shut down, nobody's building. But at the same time, our startups are finding that some of the companies they've had trouble getting time to talk to actually have time to talk to them now, even though they're talking remotely. And several of our companies have closed significant new enterprise deals in the last few weeks, which we're very pleased with. We were hoping that would happen and it has happened. So I'm not completely pessimistic. And if any of you are looking at launching, you know, a seed company right now, if it really has a very attractive value proposition, you might not get the valuation you would have liked a year or two ago, but you will find there are investors like Darren's fund and our fund that will talk to you. Maybe that's enough. Let, let's love to hear Darren's perspective on this. <laughs> I completely disagree with everything Ray said. <laughs> <laughs> no, tough well, we need to have some, some yeah. controversy yeah. here, right? No, it's fantastic. Um, um, you know, a, a great saying I heard from uh, one of our investors, it, this, it is times like this um, that metal is made, the process of annealing um, and then forging and quenching and then tempering. Um, this, this forces people to be more creative, um, uh, be more conservative with the deployment of cash. Um, you see um, in venture, typically this sinusoidal wave of, of the preference being focus on growth at all costs. Don't worry about path profitability. Then saying, oh wait, no, no, no. We're back to thinking about path of profitability. And who could expect that there's gonna be money to, to invest in companies that are just burning cash and have no clear path to being able to, to be self-sustaining or profitable. Um, and so in times like this, you definitely see people going back towards being more conservative. Um, we see that in the business models and we definitely see that in the valuations. As Ray said, there is money to be had right now and there's a lot of precedent data to suggest now is the time to invest. This is when great companies are made. And if you're flush with new capital and have the, the total confidence you can weather the storm, there'll be access to talent that is higher quality and cheaper than it ever has been before. Um, and the, the sort of, yeah, necessity is the mother of invention. Um, so it's, you know, it, it, there's a bit of a recalibration happening, but it's very exciting. Um, we are seeing a, a, an increase in inbound um, from a sales standpoint. Um, as Ray said, people are at home, some are bored. Um, they, they likely don't have small children running around at home. Um, but some people are being hyper productive right now and finally have the time to take pause as projects are on pause to look at the market or, you know, look at the, the um, sort of landscape of available solutions to try to say, man, okay, now I've got a much bigger pain point right now. Um, are there any tools out there that might be able to help us? If we're trying to work from home, oh man, okay, what are some of the collaboration tools? Um, you know, if, if it sounds like I'm limited to only having two people on a job site, but that doesn't work. Uh, how much can I take off the job site then and try to do it? And there's, it's exciting to see some of the attendees here. Um, this is square in the wheelhouse of some of the people that are focused on um, really driving uh, offsite construction, prefab, trying to make construction look more like a manufacturing environment. Um, there's some some big names and also some some younger, smaller names um, in the audience, which is exciting to see. Um, but a, a great analogy, um, anecdote to reference is, you know, both Ray and, and us, we look for the painkillers to invest in, not the aspirin or not the, <laughs> not the vitamins. Um, uh, and so the, the pain points that we're looking for solutions that solve only become more relevant right now. Um, you know, we're, as we took stock and looked at the portfolio and tried to make sure that uh, you know, our best guess is our, our companies have business models that they will have uh, at least 12 months runway um, so that as as the situation continues to develop, we have better confidence in what does the future look like. Um, it, it is it is tough if a later stage company that isn't demonstrating real traction, it needs to go out and raise capital right now, a large round. Um, but, uh, you know, I think in hopefully several months time, we'll see an uptick, we'll also see um, increased adoption and increase in total addressable market for a lot of the solutions that um, uh, we're, we're actively investing in and have already invested in. 
so I, I take it that's you know more of a uh, add-on and a comment on both of what you said. Like you're not, you don't seem to be worried at all about the uh, capacity for say like institutional uh, companies that may, whether they they're in the, anywhere in AEC, like whether they're in design, construction, uh, subs, uh, wherever they may be on their ability to buy uh, these solutions. One of the things I'm asking you this because one of the things I'm uh, worried about and I'm seeing is uh, you might have uh, companies that have much, yes, they have bigger problems, but they also have less leverage to invest in things and try new things. And the consequences of doing something wrong are also much dearer. Uh, I'm thinking about a GC, yeah. for instance. So, so how do you guys think about that? Yeah. I think um, uh, right now, as people are seeing halted projects or they're wrapping up um, the work that they have in progress and, and might not be booking new work, that could be pretty terrifying. But up until three months ago, things had never been better. Uh, people in many cases had higher margins. Some companies are sitting on more cash than they ever had. Um, so they might be looking at it and, and trying to figure out what does three months or six months look like from right now? But as far as perhaps some having some of the resources and in, in the time, talent, and treasure, there's a short moment that people are sort of scrambling and saying, okay, we do have a limited amount of money to put to work. We are going to have to figure out how to work in a more distributed fashion. We're going to have to figure out how to um, do more with less as far as people go and capital in the future. And so start evaluating what's out there and do it quickly because we need to be up and running again in the immediate future. Um, so it's times are tough from a business standpoint, um, uh, but you know, there's, there's a number of forcing functions and I think there are many organizations that do have more time right now to, to very thoroughly evaluate solutions. Um, you know, the more that you can get the attention of an end customer, to really dig in and, and understand the full value of the solutions and the full extent of the um, sort of um, functionality, the more they hopefully love and become attached to a product. Um, it's easy to justify selling for a high amount if people realize it is an incredibly valuable solution. But if you only sort of master 10% of the functionality, might not see it as valuable as if you are have trained an organization to be fluent um, in the full capabilities of those solutions. You know, we have also seen some of our portfolio companies pivot very quickly to develop solutions that address COVID. For example, Rumbix, which gathers field time card data, developed a COVID check-in form because they have a very flexible uh, design your own form kind of capability within the software. Yeah. So within two weeks of COVID shutting down the first construction sites, they, they had deployed already and were selling an application to check people in at the job site and, you know, ask them all the questions you get asked if you try to go into any business these days. Has anyone been to China or Iran or Italy? You know, has anyone in your family or your circle had the uh, diagnosis of COVID, et cetera? And a uh, company that's on the call, I saw Alistair Mishner from Drawboard is on the call. They have tools for remote markup of PDF versions of BIM documents and other documents that, that can be done collaboratively. Their business has actually boomed right now because people are working from home and they need convenient ways to mark up uh, documents and, and have coordination meetings remotely. So there are opportunities right now, f even for existing companies. And as both Darren and I have said before, you know, if you have an interesting new company with a real valuable idea and a path to profitability, we'd like to talk to you. Mm -hmm. And yeah, in sort of in the US, at least the, the Wartime Production Act, um, uh, sort of uh, ability to take a company that was developing something, have them uh, pivot of sorts or halt progress to develop a, a, a solution to an immediate need. Um, startups are more nimble than just about anybody, but in an effort to be able to pursue profitability and raise additional features, I mean, raise additional capital in the future, um, people need to force rank what features they're trying to develop. Five months ago, nobody would likely pay for contact tracing in the event that there is a pandemic. <laughs> it wasn't on people's radar, but right now, People are approaching startups and saying, hey, you, you know, you were doing that real-time location tracking solution. 
Um, so I just knew where my people were and equipment and tools. Is there a way that you can leverage that um, to tell me when people are in contact with each other? And the developers of solutions say, of course, <laughs> that's what we've been doing, but what information do you want? We're not trying to provide you everything, but right now, if there is customer pull, um, a lot of these solutions can be developed very easily. Same with prefab modular builders. I, I noticed that Blockable's on. Um, you know, they delivered uh, one of the first uh, quarantine units to Washington State Department of Health not too long ago. Um, you might be focusing, you know, you might have business focused on commercial multifamily or single family housing that is perfecting the, the sort of tools and talent um, to be able to develop um, sort of more complex products um, and end solutions. But, you know, if you're manufacturing an automobile and someone says, I just really want the rolling chassis and don't worry about putting any of the interior finishes in, that is easy to do. Um, so there, yeah. there is opportunity, um, but so startups need to wait and see when there is demand and when people are willing to pay for it. You know, one thing a crisis forces you to do is to take a really hard look at your resources, whether you're a startup and thinking, who are the most valuable people in this company? Who are people that I probably should have let go because they're not really performing? As one yeah. of our previous university presidents said, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. I think Winston yeah. Churchill, <laughs> someone else said it sooner. But a crisis forces you to get really, really tough minded about what you really need and what you don't. And so if you and as Darren said, there's lots of talent available to be hired right now because some companies will fail during this period. Mm -hmm. So this actually, uh, we, uh, we, we, we spent more time than I thought because this was a really interesting conversation. Uh, we only have about 10 minutes left. So I think it's time to open it up for the audience if you have questions. I already have a few um, that I'm going to just uh, ask you guys and you know maybe try to answer like, fast so we can have a few you know a few people like ask us questions but first one is from somebody i think you both know uh danny hall who's in switzerland right now uh post in mid covid 19 do you expect to see more less or the same levels of silicon valley vc interest in european aec startups and you're both very much targeted <laughs> well, I'll answer very quickly we've invested in in one company in what used to be the european union which is in london uh, we've not invested in any of the European um, continent yet, although we're certainly not opposed to it. Mm -hmm. um, and I would have to do a quick tally, but I think more than half of our portfolio is outside the US. Um, given the global context of construction um, uh, and the fact that um, there is innovative talent, smart thinkers, great teams, um, and a lot of experience around the globe. We very actively are, are sort of trying to source solutions um, uh, uh, all over. Um, and frankly, from a, a just a pure investment standpoint, um, we see that valuations are much more reasonable. Uh, work ethic can be great. Um, and so we, we are... Um, very actively trying to source solutions from uh, outside our backyard and even the the U.S. in general. Um, what we what we do see in some of those other markets is that there is less access to venture capital, um, or the the investors out there might be much more conservative and much more risk averse. In, in venture capital, especially early stage, you can't be too risk averse because it is nothing but risk. There is hopefully great re reward, but um, it is unclear what the technology risk might be. Can you build it? What are going to be market adoption risk? Are there regulatory risks? And, you know, is there other competition bubbling up? Uh, are we going to be able to secure future financing? Uh, it is all risk. So you try to size that up and have sort of mitigation plans. Um, but it, it makes it challenging. It, it's great to see that most countries and, and sort of geographies are starting to see an increase in local support. Um, whether that is government um, or if it is uh, private investment firms. Um, and so it's, uh, we don't care where you come from. Right now it is tough because travel is a little bit limited, but uh, as you can see um, through this, there's ways that you can remain connected um, yeah. and uh, you have less time on planes. You know, one of the points that I'll make to build on what Darren said is we see a lot of really interesting innovation in Europe. 
but partly because there's been much less access to this early risk capital. These companies come up with fabulous ideas in places like Aachen in Germany and Paris in France and other countries, and then they bring their technology to the US market where there's more access to this kind of capital. And again, if, if, you know, if Darren and I wanted to be on the board of a company, it's easier to be on the board of a San Francisco company or even a Southern California company than it is a company that's 12, you know, eight, nine, 10, 12 hours away in Israel or South Africa or, or Paris or, or Berlin. But um, we're not afraid of that. So if we see good opportunities uh, from those countries, we, we're not afraid to invest in them. But we have not uh, so far. Have a Second question, uh, much much more general and like opening it up, uh, but uh, it's from uh, Chloe Claire, the uh, CTO of Vinci Construction. And the question is, do you really think there will be a greener rebound uh, or facing the economic emergency or will just go back to business as usual? Like it's, a, it's, it's quite an opening compared to what we're talking about, but that's something mm -hmm. that's been talked about tremendously uh, in France. I, I haven't followed it as much in, uh, in the United States. And what, what, what's your take on that from the innovation point of view? Yeah. And for clarification, is greener, um, are you saying environmental sustainability and responsibility yeah, exactly. is greener? Yeah, so and I love the uh, color. But. Yeah. We, we have uh, one of our early portfolio investments is a company that makes uh, cement substitutes that have near zero embedded CO2. Um, I think Vinci already knows about that company called Ultra High Materials. Uh, we see much more interest in that, interestingly, in Europe and, and the UK than we do in the US so far, although the US is getting much more interested in, in sustainable um, materials and sustainable construction. Darren, I'm not sure what you guys see on your side. Uh, you know, it's been an a ongoing trend, um, but it was, I think there's always been a tendency to sort of fall back to business as usual. Um, you know, the nature of the construction industry uh, of uh, sort of bid based um, best guess of performance and costs based on past performance. Um, there's sometimes a tendency to default to what you're familiar with and execute from there. Um, new products um, oftentimes require um, uh, getting certain certifications. Um, uh, there's a little bit of a leap of faith for whoever that first person is. Um, I think right now, um, if you do see um, government spending on infrastructure, uh, when government is a client, uh, that can be a pretty interesting situation that, um, you know, the golden rule sometimes applies that he or she who has the gold can set the rules. And so there can be mandates uh, on um, uh, either total carbon footprint. Um, um, and so there's, there's a, a chance um, there is interest and there's a lot of talk. Um, we haven't seen um, the industry as a whole um, uh, start um, sort of electively um, uh, paying for greener solutions. But, um, you know, I'm, I am hoping that this will be a, a catalyst for it as people sort of are forced to take stock, throw away the concept of business as usual. Um, start thinking about um, uh, different ways to innovate, become more agile, more used to evaluating solutions and piloting them and ultimately deploying them. And through that effort, become much more um, comfortable with things like exploring new tools and materials, um, workflows, processes. The, the area where we've seen a lot of interest in this is the big global tech companies, the Amazon, not particularly Amazon, but uh, Google, mm -hmm. Apple, Facebook yep. uh, really are, are pushing the frontier, probably Google more than anyone. Yeah. Yeah. And then again, we see in Europe much more emphasis on this than in the US so far. Yeah. But it is likely customer driven um, because ultimately, if it comes to it and you're presented a couple options and say, this one's a fairly dirty process, but here's a greener one, hasn't been used and it's 10 times the cost. Um, uh, you know, it, it takes a, a special type of client um, or someone that is not purely driven by cost. In many cases, these green materials also have other benefits, either um, uh, sort of um, uh, reduced operating costs or replacement costs over the life of the physical asset. Um, and so more and more as people are thinking sort of longer term or across the full life cycle, 
um, of these projects um, and underlying built asset. Um, I think those become stronger um, uh, sort of value props. Well, we actually ran out of time. I don't know if you have time for one more question or if we just we should just leave it here. That's fine mm -hmm. if, if you would like to. Or... I have one that's from uh, Vivin that's uh, um, out of uh, the Hilti office uh, in San Francisco working in innovation. And his question is about consolidation. Uh, how much of it will happen due to the pandemic, both in construction and in the startup landscape? Uh, adding on that, I, I wanted to ask that question because we are seeing some GCs wanting to buy out some of their suppliers because otherwise they're not going to get their supplies. Same thing might happen for very specialized uh, construction startups or like context startups. Are they going to go faster towards uh, Papa Autodesk? Like what's going to happen? Well, there's there's sort of a, an arms race been going on between what I would call the the platform soup to nuts companies like SAP and and you know other ERP companies. So, Autodesk, BIM 360, Trimble, uh, Oracle, etc. Procore even uh, probably has more point solutions than anybody else. Versus the best of breed startups being able to be integrated more easily, and it's often that you see merger and acquisition activity go up in a downturn because people feel they can get bargains and and they can. And so I would expect to see more M and A activity, more of these big um integrated solution companies buying point solutions in the next year or two yeah yeah that certain organizations uh headed into 2020 with incredibly strong balance sheets um and might be going on a shopping spree thinking that there are good deals to be had um there are a lot of groups that won't be able to weather the storm um, that had weaker balance sheets um and really feel the pain of basically economies closing uh, and then you might also see more of um, the mergers um, that sort of true mergers of two teams coming together saying, doesn't look good for me, but together uh, we are a stronger solution um, and can provide more value and have higher odds of survival. Um, so it does seem likely, um, but um, right now people are still figuring out their sort of coronavirus action plans what are their overall strategies? Some are still wrapping up end of year audits in 2019. So um, before really going on a shopping spree, a lot of people are just kind of getting the house in order. Um, and there is um, a, a strong chance that you'll see an increase in M&A towards the sort of second half or last quarter of the year. Yep, agreed. And one of the areas I think you'll see it is in, in the whole area of payment processing, fast payments to subcontractors. Uh, we basically require the least financially capable people to finance construction projects by waiting 90 days to get paid for the materials and labor. And if you fix that, you save about 5 to 8% of construction cost. So it's a huge opportunity where you could imagine um, digital twin companies doing automated inspections, companies that organize documents for banks like eDraw and Textura and so on, merging with digital um, image capture companies and banks and, and others to, to create payment solutions that are better than what's available right now. And that would be this kind of merger that would be two plus two equals five or six. Well, we're going to have to wrap it up. Uh, I, thank you very much uh, to both of you for, uh, for joining. That was uh, beyond my expectations. <laughs> I think uh, the public was pretty interested. Unfortunately, we couldn't answer all the questions. I'm sorry about that. Uh, I'm going to move to the networking part of this. Uh, I don't think that uh, our speakers are going to be able to join, but if you're still online and you want to connect to some other people that might be there, it's a weird little funny feature if you haven't tried it. Um, it's kind of like a random connecting you to someone random for a couple of minutes and then moving on. Anyway, uh, on that note, uh, I can't like have the audience clap, so I'll clap for you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, but, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much.